Alrighty. Hey gang, welcome back. Another episode of Zero Carb Journal. This is going to be episode four. And as always, I'm excited to be here and thrilled to be sharing with you guys. Um, I got to say, this has all been really, really, really uh, profound. Profound is the right word. Profound for me. Um, hearing your stories, getting your support, sharing my story. Um, I'm just very, very thankful for this opportunity and for all of you guys out there. So thanks very much for listening to me and showing your support. And, and I really hope, as always, that, that this finds somebody, um, yeah, when they need it and, and, and hope it's useful to you guys. So I'm going to, today, I'm going to talk about um, what I eat in a day. And along with that, I'm going to talk about how that's changed uh, as I've progressed here. I'm coming up on my year anniversary of only uh, carnivore lifestyle. And so I'll talk about adaptation phase and what I went through um, and what I've heard from others, what they're experiencing and um, what you might expect if you're hoping to give this a try uh, and how I sort of shaped my my meals and the way I eat um, as time has progressed according to uh, the way I was feeling, have been feeling, and my inputs and things like that. So, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm probably going to repeat myself a lot throughout this series. Uh, before we start, I think I'll just talk about what my intentions are here. I do intend to keep this going. I think I'll try to do one of these every week. I'm not sure if I'll be able to maintain that as we go along. It's kind of... <laughs> boring probably i mean i really it's 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 so simple uh this video could really just be 30 seconds of me saying two pounds of ground beef see you later <laughs> but uh, of course i won't do that i really have a lot to share um and that's why i'm going to repeat myself i'm going to i'm sure go over lots of old points and things like that but hopefully i'll dig a little deeper into some things as we go and and elaborate on some of my beliefs and and that kind of stuff so <clears throat> yeah so let's talk about um what I eat in a day first, I guess, right now, and then I'll talk about adaptation and, and how my, um, the things I've been eating and my desires and, and things like that have changed uh, over this past year. So at the moment, um, you know, I, I weigh right now about 100, and, well, this morning was like 130, just under 133 pounds. Um, I've been doing something that's not recommended on zero carb it's not part of the normal zero carb um paradigm uh, or context you know most people come here through often obesity um, and metabolic distress um, in various forms which i was in that category as i talked about my blood pressure and my blood sugar and my adiposity coming on um, but I'm definitely not the norm. Many folks come here after a lifetime of struggling with their weight and finally realizing that the carbohydrates are addictive and, and probably driving that metabolic um, disorder, at least in their case or in my case. So, you know, I'm doing something right now that's pretty outside of the norm in zero car, but I'm finding it incredibly incredibly effective for me and very profound in the sense that uh, for the last few years um, when I when I first started getting my health or chasing my health and chasing my fitness uh, three years ago or four almost four years ago now um, you know I did the normal stuff right I counted calories and I really restricted myself trying to beat that um, battle of the bulge there my my spare tire and um, along the way, I picked up all those habits, right? Counting calories, restricting, um, you know, really weighing myself every day and paying close attention and <clears throat> adjusting my, my inputs to that data. And so when I came to zero carb, you know, the advice is to not do any of that. And of course, that this is going to go into the ad adaptation phase discussion, because it's one of the hardest things when you're transitioning, you know, I struggled for so long I could hold myself at a maintenance level I mean I did this for years you guys I I have data like notebooks and um, online graphs of my weight and and uh, my fitness pal on a chronometer with all my daily meals tracked in I mean logged in for days and I mean for years really 
And what I found was that 1,800 calories was what I needed to eat when I was eating carbs to lose weight at a reasonable level and still be able to kind of maintain somewhat of a quality of life, although I was really struggling, and I think that I did that for probably far too long. Um, about 2,000 calories, and I would basically maintain uh, little slight fluctuations up and down. Um, and, you know, the thing that frustrated me the most was that I would read, oh, yeah, bulk, you know, I, I was trying to get stronger all this time. I, I got thin. I got too thin. As I told you, I had that a time when I couldn't eat and I was terrified. And then I got really thin. I'd already gotten pretty thin and then I got really sick. And that was really what was scary was I was already close to the edge and then I couldn't eat or put on weight. So shortly after that, you know, I was trying to gain muscle without gaining my belly and become stronger. And what I would find was I would follow the regular advice of three to 500 calories above your maintenance to try and bulk. And I would just instantly get a belly. Um, and of course, all my other symptoms would come on too. I would start feeling all that inflammation. So, um, you know, that was, that was a real struggle for me for a long time. So when I came to zero carb, I was conditioned to do that. And, you know, I know if any of you guys are thinking about this or, or starting to do it, that can be a really tough battle to get over. I mean, I was sure that a couple hundred calories over my line and I was just going to deteriorate in the sense of getting bigger and, and not um, move towards my goals in a way that I wanted to. I thought I would just get fatter and, and fatter. So um, in the early days, I started by, you know, continuing to count calories and look at macros and stuff. And I'm just going to, I'll come back to this, I think, because I want to talk about what I'm eating now. Um, but I'm going to say that, boy, that was a huge mistake. <laughs> and in hindsight, it's easy for me to see why, but it's really also easy to see why we get trapped into that and why we are going to believe that. And so, um, you know, don't let me tell you not to do that, but just to let me warn you to be careful and, and, uh, and to pay attention, um, to what I'm going to say about that as I move forward and pay attention to yourself and uh, keep an open mind that maybe things are different and changing and, uh, and that the old rules don't really apply. So with that said, where I'm at now, you know, I have been, um, after I got well adapted, I'm going to say six months before I, eight months even before I really started to put this program into place, um, you know, I, I stopped counting calories and I just kind of ate to satiety and my weight stayed exactly the same. Now I came to zero carb about 10 pounds over what I wanted to be. Um, and it was mostly abdominal adiposity. Like I'd said, I'd started to try and bulk on my old diet that included carbs and, and I would just blow up, balloon up. And, and that was the case when I came to zero carb, I was acne and inflamed and, and bloated. And I, I weighed about 143 pounds last February when I started. And so I just kind of stayed the course through most of this year. Um, didn't count calories once I got past that hump and didn't limit myself. I just ate as much as I wanted, really. And it's really, 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 really profound. It was really interesting to see how my satiety came online. And I, and I did. I could pig out um, on a weekend and really enjoy myself. And then, you know, I wouldn't be hungry the next day. I would just eat a little. So... And that was natural. Um, I didn't restrict myself or limit myself. My weight stayed virtually the same. It would go up and down three and four pounds. I never really went much above that 143, 44, a couple oddball outlier measurements, but I stayed right around there. Um, and I made a few efforts to kind of restrict now and then, but mostly I just sort of let it ride. In the last few months, um, I finally kind of was looking at all my progress pictures and going, gosh, I just have not put on any muscle. Um, I'm just maintaining and, and that was fine, but I have strength goals. I want to be able to do a front lever and uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to do a planche, but I'm trying like heck. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, I've been trying to get stronger and, and want those goals. So I realized I was going to just have to start eating. Right. So for, the, um, November and the first half of December, and I think some of October too, I've been eating about four pounds of ground beef a day. I mean, that is a lot. That's an enormous amount. Now I do, as I mentioned, I do grill it. Um, and I grill it in burgers. So I lose a lot of the fat. So I've tried 
at times to sort of estimate how the calories and fat are panning out. I, I weigh before a couple times and weighed after, and, and I would start with 16 ounces of raw meat and look at those calories. But I would come out with about nine ounces of cooked meat, so or even eight sometimes, and and then look at the calories of that on chronometer and try and figure it out. So it's hard to say. I I roughly estimate that one of those pounds of meat, the way I cook it, kind of cooks down with the fat out of it to come in at um, somewhere low in fat relative to most folks who eat this way. I'm probably 50-50. Uh, that's by calorie, um, and maybe even less. Uh, fat. I might even be more like 40% fat, 60% protein. Now that's backwards. People who haven't done this and people who have done this and, and you know are successful the other way are going to say, oh, that's way too little. But that's how I feel the best. Um, and I can do that for weeks, uh, cooking most of the fat out of it. Most. I don't think it's most, but some, a lot. Um, and what I found out was, you know, by looking, my best estimate is that a thousand, or um, excuse me, uh, a pound of beef when I cook it that way is turning out to be something like 800 to to 900 calories as best I can imagine or best I can figure. So I ate about four pounds of meat cooked that way for the last few months and I did. I gained um, a little bit of weight. I ended up kind of right back where I started a year ago. The highest I think I saw in the last few months was about 144. Um, but it was different. It was all, it was shoulders and, and upper body and, and legs. <laughs> Got to be careful. I did a bunch of, uh, I grew up, as I've mentioned, um, you know, in action sports. I was a competitive snowboarder. I spent my life in the snowboard industry, the first half of my life in the snowboard industry, and an average surfer. Um, I was always doing those things. So my legs and mountain biking and in the off-season to train and all, the, all that kind of stuff. So my legs have a lot of uh, potential to be built really big and so I find that I gain muscle there quickly and weight and size and that's fine um, but I'm really going for the upper body so I do uh, you know sometimes I don't fit in my pants after a few months of this <laughs> and that's kind of my indicator so at any rate uh, what am I trying to say here what I'm trying to say is I did four pounds of meat a day for let's say two months and I kind of just slowly I have a nice little weight graph maybe I'll put it up here on the video but I just sort of gained at a nice steady rate and it felt like I was gaining muscle I didn't gain a whole lot of adiposity but my pants started getting tighter um, and so around the 15th of December my pants were too tight and I was wanting to keep going I want to get stronger so I thought well I'll just do a little cut and get myself back down to fighting weight <laughs> and uh, get my abs showing and and then keep building up from there and so I've been for the last two going on three weeks now eating two pounds of ground beef a day cooked the same way so that's a big jump right that's half as much and oddly enough you know I just I don't really feel hungry a little bit now and then I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes just a little bit of hunger pangs and I tell myself to suck it up which isn't really a great thing you guys don't do this unless you're um, have some you know, strength goals or things like that. Um, but it's working for me and, it, and it's so much easier than it was when I was eating carbs. I mean, it's so much easier. The hunger pangs are minor and, and rare, to be honest. Finish my meal and I'm satisfied, you know. And that's one thing, and I got this from my buddy Jim Caldwell on Twitter. And Jim, thank you very much for the inspiration. He, he made a great point. And that was, he does a one meal a day thing. And he's not, I don't think he's a zero carb guy, although I'm not sure. Um, but he does a one meal a day thing. And he made a really great point. And that was that, you know, uh, when he was counting and restricting and all that. And, and when I was, I would have all these little 300 and 400 and 500 and 600 calorie meals. And I was always hungry and never satisfied. But as he went to his one meal a day, and in my case, uh, with zero carb, you sort of naturally drift to an intermittent fasting type schedule so i eat tend to eat, i just ate it's it's uh, 12 30 here now i ate at about 11 30 um, and i'll eat again probably about 5 30 or 6 and uh so that's just a natural progression i'm not restricting my food in the morning i just am not really hungry i work out in the morning and and go do whatever i need to do and and usually i come back and i'm ready to eat so but he made a great point and that was that you know you, you can eat the same calories let's say it's 2,000 calories a day but you eat them all in in a small window and you are full and you're satisfied and so I don't know that's part of it I think being a fat burner is a big part of it I no longer have spikes and, and highs and lows and, and insulin and 
and uh, low blood sugar and all those things kind of driving me to require energy when I've got plenty of nutrition um, because I was running on sugar and just needed to keep feeding that beast. So for whatever reason, it's very, very easy for me to manage my intake according to my goals without measuring, without counting, um, other than what I just said, sort of just a casual oh, four pounds, two pounds. Um, and if I'm hungry, maybe I'll eat three pounds. You know, I don't, I'm not really like I was before. Like I'm not hard on myself because I don't need to be. You know, I noticed after a year. Now, if I want to gain weight, it's the opposite kind of. It's like, you know, before when I was eating carbs, I had to work my butt off to lose weight. And gaining weight was a byproduct of not paying attention. And it's actually like 180 degrees the opposite here on zero carb. Um, losing weight is almost the norm if you don't pay attention. Uh, it's it's easy to not eat enough. You don't really get these overwhelming singles, signals of hunger. Um, and you don't get them, you know, snack attack all the time. You just... and And because you're limited in what you eat and because you don't care for snacks and you're not addicted to sugar and there's nothing driving those things you kind of just go through the day without ever really thinking about putting something else in your mouth until it's dinner time so it's 180 degrees out from eating carbs in terms of that you know when i want to gain weight i have to work out eating four pounds a day is something that i don't do easily i put four i cook four pounds um and then i try and get through it and if i don't i don't i'm not hard on myself but again you know i had to work to gain and and it's effortless to lose and maintaining is basically just a natural progression you buy my body at least on this wave and he seems to just ride at its normal set point without me thinking about it at all it's so wonderful you guys i feel free <laughs> for the first time ever uh or the first time in a long time due to that so that'll uh, bring me back to what I eat in the day and how I do it. So whether it was the four pounds of beef or the two pounds of beef, and again, this is why this video could be so short and boring, you know, I really just flatten them into little burgers and throw them on the grill and three minutes aside, and, and that's it. That's what I eat. Now I'll go into some details about how I've progressed here because that sounds pretty strange. You know, you're going to be like, whoa, no seasoning, no coffee, no, you know, I didn't start here. And um, I think it would have been very difficult to start here, probably, I would guess. Um, although maybe not, I might have made things worse on myself by just second guessing myself. But uh, at any rate, that's what I eat in a day. I just eat hamburgers for the most part. Now, I'm starting to change that a little bit. I think I mentioned in the last time. I'm really blessed, you guys. I'm so fortunate. Gosh, I am so grateful every day, too, for how lucky I am um, in so many ways. But one of my uh, biggest benefits is I live here in the Pacific Northwest, and I tend to work. Um, I do a lot of different things. I don't, <laughs> I won't go into that yet. <laughs> but I've, you know, had to become flexible over the years because of my special needs, I guess I'll say. So I have a lot of different jobs, a lot of different hats, a lot of different skills. And one of the um, industries that I do a lot of work in is the um, marine trades. I do a lot of uh, building boats. And up here, a lot of those boats are commercial fishing boats or sport fishing boats. So got a lot of friends uh, with freezers full of fish. So I'm fortunate that I just got uh, a wonderful gift from a friend of all of his fish that was too old for him because he's going to get a new load so I got a, a freezer full of uh, wild Alaskan halibut and salmon and so I've been eating my one pound of beef or two uh, two pounds of beef and I'm adding a little bit of salmon once in a while um, usually every few days I'll have a little bit you know an eight ounce piece of salmon or so along with my hamburger so I guess I'm eating a little bit more calories once in a while sometimes I'll take out some of the beef but usually I just kind of eat the salmon <clears throat> uh, and I do that to try and well because I love the salmon <laughs> and to try and bolster you know some of the nutritional um, theoretical gaps in all beef now we talk about um, I you know I say that I at this point I'm I'm fairly convinced that there are real no nutritional gaps when I eat enough beef I don't feel like there are any. My doctor doesn't uh, seem to think there are any. He does encourage me to eat eggs and fish. Um, but, you know, from all the blood work and everything else that we're getting, it, it, it looks like I've been fine, and I didn't have fish for many, many months or eggs. I really was just beef while I when I finally got down to my stripped-down version um, and started to feel really well again. So from a nutritional standpoint, I'm not sure that any of that is really extremely important. 
Um, but I do feel, you know, like I enjoy eating the fish and like it probably has some really good um, nutrition for me that I may may or may not be getting in the same levels from ruminants. So I eat about a pound of beef for my first meal. Like I say, that's usually, let's say, 11 in the morning. Um, and then again, I eat a pound of beef at about six, let's say, in the evening. And that's it. Dead simple. <laughs> so let's go back to how I started and adaptation and um, what I ate along the way and what I've heard other people eat and things like that. So adaptation, let me tell you guys, no one's immune. You know, it doesn't matter if you're on five grams of plant carbs with your keto diet or 300 grams of um, carbohydrates on a, you know, rice and beans diet. Um, you're going to probably have some rough moments and maybe days and maybe weeks when you start out. Um, there's a lot of potential reasons for this. There's a lot of of concepts. I don't think anything is nailed down. I can certainly speculate. Um, I think one of the biggest ones is, you know, along the way I quit coffee and I got to tell you that addiction is no joke, right? Um, quitting coffee was probably one of the hardest things I ever did. I used to like to drink beer and, and, and drink. I thought it was a lot. I don't think I really ever, um, had a terrible problem, but I, I liked to drink and I made you know, my own beers and, and stuff and wine. And, um, and it was no problem for me to drop that. And, um, I smoked, not really smoked cigarettes, but I, you know, I was worked on some film crews with some Europeans and we would smoke our pot with, uh, tobacco. <laughs> and so I got, um, hooked on tobacco for a few years there. And, and that was hard to quit. Let me tell you, I didn't, I didn't ever get too deep into it, but I know what it's like to quit an addiction and coffee was awful. Coffee was probably the worst. I, it, I was a wreck for a couple weeks, the better part of a couple weeks anyways. And, and I was almost useless. You know, I had to lie down and, and, you know, have horrible headaches and it was bad. And so when I'm talking about adaptation, I think that a big part of it is that sugar fires off those same places in our brain, right? Um, so I know it's kind of wacky uh, to some, but I do think we are addicted to sugar. We become addicted to sugar. And, and remember that sugar is just carbohydrates broken down. Uh, don't pick on me on the semantics on that, please. But you know that, you know, a piece of bread, even if it's whole grain, is going to turn into 75% of that is just going to be um, sugar energy without much nutrition. And so we get addicted and, and that adaptation phase, you're breaking an addiction and it's rough, people. It can be incredibly hard. So that's one aspect. And I think that is a big one. Um, there's also the gut biome and the fiber. You know, you've been feeding this separate, I won't say separate, it's part of us, but it's a living organism in your, in, in our intestinal tract, uh, that is comprised of a whole lot of organisms that are eating what we've been feeding it. And when you start starving them out, things get pretty weird for a little while there. So if you're coming from a high carb, high fiber, you know, you're going to have some complaints <laughs> down there. And as we know now, the vagus nerve, I always say that wrong. I have no idea. I just don't have only read it, you guys. So forgive me if I pronounce it wrong. Vagus, vagus. You know, we know that's a two-way street. The hypothalamus and the intestinal um, tract are conveying information back and forth. And who knows who's really running the show, right? You know, if you, again, it sounds bonkers, but the deeper you go into the current science on it, you'll find there's a whole lot of evidence that uh, we're thinking from our guts as much as we are from our heads. So, you know, you're murdering all these little guys. <laughs> they don't want that to go down. So they're going to hang on for dear life. And I think that causes a lot of problems for people with that in adaptation. I believe that was a big part of my adaptation struggles. You know, I came from the specific carbohydrate diet where I was really chasing my bio, making homemade yogurt, lactose free with the right bacteria and really paying attention to dosing and prebiotics and I believe wholeheartedly in the microbiome. Um, and so I think it, it was in there just going, what the heck, dude? C 
cut it out. And so, you know, in, in adaptation phase, due to that aspect, you're going to get incredible discomfort, probably um, some bad bathroom moments. And more than that, because that two-way street, you know, I think it's going to drive your brain to, to, to try everything, to try and get you to stuff some carbs in your mouth and to stop doing this crazy thing. Um, so it could be depression, it could be anxiety, uh, acne um, with inflammation, you know, night sweats were a really common one for me. I think I forgot to mention that last time. You just wake up soaked. Um, skin rashes, that's one I didn't talk about. You know, all my life I was sensitive to chemicals. I learned when I was about 20 that dryer sheets would give me hives all around my waistband. Um, and since then, I really just started avoiding all detergents and things like that. Um, and so a lot of those symptoms kind of kept cropping up in my adaptation phase. And, and, you know, it's it's disconcerting. I mean, you're here, you are making this change, like I'm going to get better. And for a little while there, it might not seem like you're getting better. You know, I stuck with it because I kept having these moments, these, these glimpses of what was going to come down the road. Now, my adaptation was particularly rough, I think. I was sick when I got here. I was having those horrible, painful um, urgency symptoms, chronic diarrhea. I was on the toilet a lot. I was bleeding a little bit at the time. Um, and, and as I came to Zero Carb, I was pretty unprepared, uh, and I was second-guessing. And so I did a lot of the things that you really you got to do, right? You have to eat a lot of fat, um, you know, make sure you eat enough, all that stuff. So I started and I was stuffing myself and I was stuffing myself with things that kind of were outside of what had been my norm. I, I was eating, I ate some butter. Um, I, I was eating ham just because I had it in the freezer uh, and it had a lot of fat on it. Um, what else was I eating? I was still in coffee at the time. I don't think that was a problem. Um, I didn't dabble with cheese. I, I had eggs in there, you know. So when I started, I was sort of any meat. Um, I still haven't had any fowl. I haven't for a long time. I had a couple bites of duck at an event, but um, but for the most part, I've been staying away from the bird. Uh, not for any real reason, just because I have chickens out there and it's winter and, and they're going to be laying next year and I'll probably maybe eat some of them I don't know I'm I'm just it seems lean and it doesn't seem very appealing to me right now so I don't have anything against it um but yeah so I was eating pork and ruminants and eggs and fish and a little bit of butter um and coffee and in the early days oh I got really sick you guys and I wonder now if I have something with butter um, I did suspect I was lactose intolerant I know butter really shouldn't have any or much at all uh, but those first few weeks yeah I had some awful moments um, vomiting and and uh, a lot of diarrhea and really bad stomach pain and and so yeah I think you know die off in the biome um, a sugar addiction uh, and then not to mention, I didn't even go into probably the biggest physiological part that we know of is that you're going to become a fat burner. And if you're running on carbs, there's a lot of physiological pathways and, and processes that, that need to literally physically change over. And, and from everything I've read, that takes quite a bit of time, at least for many of us, it does. So, you know, your body eventually says, well, we're not getting any more, <laughs> sugar so you know it, it it slowly starts converting and now i'm going to be out way out of my depth but whatever the energy um metabolism mechanism is starts to realize it's going to need to do it with fat and it starts to switch everything over so your organs kind of start to prioritize fat the ones that can burn fat which is most of them you know other than our brain or maybe parts of our brain i don't know enough to go too far into that and in my case as a boy my uh, sex organs and maybe maybe women's too. I'm not sure about that. They need some glucose and our, our livers are just fine at creating that from um, protein via gluconeogenesis. Is that right? <laughs> at any rate, um, you know, we make our own glucose uh, in plenty adequate amounts without any stresses on our bodies to keep the things that need it going. That's a really important point because once you get adapted, your blood sugar you know, we now have stable blood sugar. We're not sending things in, into, 
you know, haywire by by giving it 50 grams of sugar in a setting and then none for a few hours and, and, and so on. So you get this really nice even blood sugar, um, which translates to really even energy and mood and uh, and it's wonderful, but it does take time. <clears throat> and I, you know, I firmly believe that, I mean, I still think I'm improving, but I think it was six months or so before I was really like, oh yeah, I'm like, I'm there, you know, I had low energy, my workout suffered for a month or more. Um, but I felt good. And like I said, I saw glimpses of, of, of hope and, and instantly some of the things that were the most concerning were starting to disappear. My losing a consciousness, my syncope, which, as I said, I think was an inflammation symptom. Uh, my acne was clearing my, um, urgency, the painful, you know, need to go, the painful feeling like I needed to, to, to poop, which when I didn't, um, and the acidic and mucousy uh, discharge and all of those things, those all were, were rapidly clearing up. So I knew I was, I was on the right track or thought I was, and I, and I, I wanted to give it a chance and I'm so glad I did. And that's one of the reasons why when people say, Hey folks, give it a try, but try for 30 days, uh, which I think is the absolute minimum. And I think it's great advice. And ideally, you know, once you get there, you'll be comfortable enough to go farther and see how you really feel. Um, but it doesn't do you much good to go a week and go, oh, yeah, feel better when I put some carbs in, you know, of course you do. It's like stopping smoking for five days and then having a cigarette, you know, you're going to feel better in my opinion. Um, so, you know, adaptation can be tough. You're probably going to experience some of the things I did. You might have, uh, some inflammation symptoms like, um, night sweats and, um, acne and bloating and, you know, um, uh, diarrhea and perhaps constipation. Now constipation, you know, the science studies are coming out now that says, you know, reducing or removing fiber, um, eases constipation pretty much across the board for most folks. But when you start this way of eating, what you're not used to is that your body uses all of the meat. So you have very little output. And at first, partly because you're just not used to it. And I think partly because your body is adapting and adjusting. Some folks just won't go to the bathroom for days, a week. And that's very disconcerting. Now, if that comes with a lot of discomfort, um, you know, there are some things you might want to look at. Electrolytes are real important in the early days. And I know magnesium can be a real um, driver in constipation and or the remedying of by controlling intestinal um, hydration, whether it's pulling water into the intestine or or lack thereof making it dry out i could have that backwards but again just know that if you're having some of those problems and it's and it's becoming discomfort you know uncomfortable or it's bothering you um play with your electrolytes a little bit make sure you're getting enough magnesium and i'm sure you'll work through it but like i said some folks just really you know don't go and they get um concerned rightly so because you know your stool volume is i remember reading a study in an irish uh an Irish study around the time of World War One, where they're worried about famine and they're like, can people live on just potatoes? Can people live on just meat? And I don't think they did just meat, but they, you know, vary ratios. And they noticed that it was a reduction in stool volume of like 250% uh, when carbs were removed. So you're going to have a lot less volume. Now I, as I mentioned before, I'm still regular every day, every morning. Um, but some folks, once they get to this way of eating, they don't go for a few days. And then when they do, it's perfectly normal. So that isn't constipation. Constipation is what I used to experience, that urgency, that feeling of I have to go and going to the bathroom and just having nothing come out or a little drip of stomach acid or mucus and doing that, you know, 20 times a day with great discomfort and, and disruption to my day. So that's constipation from everything I understand. You know, it can be hard impacted or, or, or dry stool as well that causes those same type of feelings. In my case, that wasn't it. Um, but removing fiber tends to remove all of those problems, but it'll take you a while to identify that it's okay and that it's not something weird because you're not going to the bathroom, you know, every day and you're not going very much when you go. So at first it can feel like constipation and hunger signals are different in the beginning too, because 
you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know why I won't say because, but you know, my hunger signals when I first started felt like a tummy ache. Um, and it took me a while to kind of sort that out. You know, I was like, Oh, I can't eat. Oh, my stomach really hurts. The reality was I needed to eat. Um, so in the first week or two, those, everything's different. Your chemistry changes, all your hormones are signaling, you know, it's all different. So you got to learn to read the water, you know, as it were, um, you got to learn to read the signs and it takes a bit of time and they're going to confuse you for a little while. So just pay as much attention as you can read other people's experiences. Try not to second guess yourself. Um, you will, you'll do what I did. You'll probably eat butter when you shouldn't, or, you know, think not that you shouldn't eat butter, but you'll do something that makes you feel ill, uh, when you were trying to do the right thing and just pay attention. Some folks need a lot of fat. Some folks don't need much at all. Um, so kind of trust your body and the beginning is going to be weird and be able to give you some, some wrong signals, mixed up, mixed signals, but, uh, you'll get there. So another part of adaptation was salt and electrolytes. And I touched on that, you know, when I started, boy, I was salting the crap out of my food. I mean, I had, I have a, a salt pig and I would grab a pinch and, and then another pinch. And I, you know, I think I was probably eating, I don't know, 10 grams of salt a day, a lot, quite a bit. And I liked it that way. I really enjoyed my food that way. And, and, um, in the beginning, it, it seemed to mess with my hydration a little bit. I've had, you know, dry mouth and, um, I was peeing a lot and, and, and I would wake up and have to pee sometimes a couple times a night. Um, and over time, you know, I kept liking salt. I think it's really ad addictive, not like the sugar is addictive, but in terms of a flavor addiction, you kind of like, ooh, I like salty stuff. Um, so in time, I, I didn't really ever lose that desire to ingest the salt, but I started playing with my levels, and I noticed that I started to like the meat just fine as I would have less and less salt. So over the last, let's say, four months, I've played with, I think back in October, I did no salt for just a few days and, and I didn't feel very well and I didn't like the food that much. So I put a, then I started to put a little on my food to see if I could just eat a little and it, it quickly grows to where, you know, you, you want the taste of salt. Um, so then I would add more and then I tried another little stint of none and I went for a couple weeks and it was pretty good. And then I just thought I'd experiment with a little bit again to see how it felt. And again, over the next couple weeks, my intake of salt climbed and that was fine. Um, but with that, as I've started to pay attention, I started to notice those other things I talked about, uh, different, you know, ability to m m moderate my hydration or manage my hydration and, and waking up in the middle of the night and things like that. And so about, um, sometime early December, I guess I just stopped eating, adding any additional salt again. And, uh, and I still haven't ha put any on and I'm really enjoying my food without any seasoning. I know that sounds absolutely bonkers when you're not here yet. Um, and I feel great and I, I sleep through the night and I am having to use the restroom a whole lot less. And I think it's having an impact on, in my case, uh, some of my diarrhea and loose stool problems. I think that some of that hydration regulation um, challenges that adding salt at a sort of random time and of random amounts can maybe bring on. And so that's going to bring me to my current theory of salt ingestion, which is that, you know, I think more than anything, it really challenged my body to regulate my hydration. It, it could never tell what was going to come down the pipe next and what it needed to do. And so I think that caused me some problems. I really do. Now we need some salt. So I looked at chronometer when I'm eating two pounds a day. Um, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, but in my, you know, little bit of what I remember and what I read, it looked like I'm probably still getting about a gram and a half, 1500 milligrams of salt a day, just through the beef, uh, by eating two pounds a day. And of course, four pounds a day, then I'm up to three grams a day, which is sort of the normal recommendation. So the reality is if you're eating ruminant meat and I assume fish, although I haven't looked, um, and you're eating it in, you know, decent amounts enough to sustain you, then you're probably getting enough salt. And I read a real recent article, um, recently, and, and I'm not going to be able to paraphrase it because it was way above my head, but it just mentioned how, you know, there's a real, interwoven relationship between your salt intake levels and, and magnesium and potassium. And so 
I feel really good these days. I feel like my electrolytes have balanced out um, wonderfully on their own without supplementing or ingesting any um, exogenous electrolytes other than what's in my food. So it's something you can look forward to. I think it. I don't think it necessarily needs to be a goal. There's plenty of long-term zero carbers who still eat salt, but there's lots of us who don't. And some of the folks who I look up to the most um, don't and, and, and make pretty good reasons. You know, a lot of them noticed face bloat or swelling or, you know, water retention or diarrhea when they would ingest salt. And it just kind of points to me that that our body gets, our hormones kind of fall in, in line under this um, way of eating. And it can manage hydration quite well without these out, you know, without these inputs of, of things that dramatically change it. So um, I feel like I'm getting enough salt. I don't, I'm not too concerned about my salt intake being too low. I feel great. And yeah, that's my progression with salt um, and electrolytes. When you are starting, pay attention to those things. I think it's important to probably continue to um, supplement. I was putting about a quarter teaspoon of salt into just my, my water bottle with a, a pinch of magnesium. I was adding potassium too. I don't recommend anyone do that. I did not know how dangerous potassium was to supplement when I started. And if you are supplementing potassium and you don't know, uh, do some Googling and make sure you just got, I don't think it's like going to, you know, it's not always a bad thing, but you want to know what you're levels are you want to know how much you're putting in and so everyone in the keto community recommends new salt which is i think a, a blend of salt and potassium chloride or something like that and that's probably a better idea than what i was doing which was just using a bulk potassium supplement which can be very dangerous uh if you overdo it um fortunately i came out of it fine but in hindsight i know that i was sort of just like wandering in the dark so i don't really recommend you do that uh, look you know but magnesium is i think safe and and uh um, you know, if you eat too much, you just get diarrhea. And in a lot of people's cases, that's what they're going for when they feel like they're low on it. So I could be wrong about that. Look it up if you're worried. I, I, I'm sure there's a way to overdose on it. You can overdose on everything, right? But within reason, I think you, you know if you ate too much magnesium without having to go to the hospital. So there's electrolytes. Um, some people talk about seeing things in their stool in the adaptation phase and if you look at yeast uh you know as when people have yeast infections and candida overgrowth and small intestinal bacteria overgrowth and when you look at some of the images it's not pretty <laughs> but if you're curious and you go on google and you can look at images of, of people's bowel movements with those issues and, and you'll see stringy um, yeast strands and things like that and so in the early days you'll probably have some of that as you remove your biome or change your biome and as Dr. Sean Baker most recently pointed out in his great new video in talking about fiber we know that fiber irritates our intestines and so we build up a mucosal layer in there you know mucus is a defense mechanism I used to have mucus leaking uh, into my underwear <laughs> sorry it's gross I know but some of you may have that and not know what it is and that's what that is and it's because you're intestinally um, uh, you know you're you're there is an irritant in there so you're gonna be getting rid of that stuff and that's part of adaptation and it can be a little bit um, disconcerting to have some weird things uh, in the toilet so that'll change but expect it if you're new, you know, especially if you're coming from a high carb um, diet. So let's see, what else should I talk about in terms of what I eat and what I don't eat and things like that. Let's do coffee. You know, I, I did talk about that. After about four months, I decided I was going to drop it just out of curiosity because I was, you know, I'm, I'm still improving. And so I'm always trying to take something out and put it back in and see how it makes me feel. And so I went after coffee. And like I said, it was miserable. It was awful. I was so addicted i love coffee you guys got my burr grinder and my aeropress and my espresso machine and my millions of ways to make it and i was you know when i went zero carb you're you're feeling sorry for yourself sometimes you know i'm so restricted um and it doesn't feel that way at all anymore it's the least restrictive diet i've ever eaten now in my opinion i know that doesn't make any sense but that's how it feels because you don't want it's not restrictive because you don't want the carbs um coffee was my crutch right I was my it was my treat so I was at like four espressos a day 
and I was hooked and quitting it was miserable. So I'm not really going to go too far into that because you all probably know that. What I am going to talk about is, is how that dovetailed into this even energy and even mood that zero carb brings you know i no longer have sugar spikes i no longer have addiction from sugar and and whatever that was doing to my brain which i don't think it does to everyone's but i know that my brain was not functioning healthily on sugar with depression and um anxiety and and highs and lows real profound and so after i got through that i i decided i'd drop coffee and, and what do you know you know um nothing nearly as profound and nothing nearly as um sort of sinister as the sugar brought out in me but certainly I I have a great appreciation for the me that isn't drinking coffee and and the way I feel like I I just am my energy is stable I wake up like I'm just ready to go you know I get up and I start working out and it's not hard I, I I I love it it feels awesome and I wake up I'm in bed I'm like clear my head is like ready I'm just sharp and and on it I don't wake up groggy um, and then that continues throughout the day. I don't. I no longer have those like coffee break times where I, you know, flatten out and need to pick me up. Um, it's really profound. I, I, I'm kind of a big fan of this no coffee state. Now that doesn't mean I am anti coffee. I don't think I'll ever go back, but I sure love coffee. And uh, you know, that's that's just my choice. At least how I feel right now, a year in. Um, that may change. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because I think that coffee is a, a fine um, medicine from plants, let's say. And it does seem, you know, many zero carbers seem to do fine on it without any negative effects. And it's a nice treat. Um, so I don't think that you need to get rid of it. And I'm actually going to maybe go against the grain a little bit. I don't know if this is or not, but I would say don't try and get rid of it during adaptation. If you're addicted to coffee, just keep it until you're well adapted because it's rough to get rid of it and to stack that on top of adaptation. Boy, that I don't know if I would have made it <laughs> personally. Um, so I think you can keep it, but I would encourage you once you get at, down the road a little ways to try without it because it's pretty profound. I'm... I, really enjoying it it's just great and then i'm going to do another i think my next one i'm going to do simple living um because one of the most profound impacts this wave eating has had on my life is is it's helped me simplify in so many ways and and of course the kitchen and getting rid of all my kitchen stuff but but the you know getting rid of coffee is part of that i just don't have the little rituals that i sort of felt like i needed to do to be complete in my day or whatever so um yeah, that's that's coffee and adaptation and addiction. And let's see, I think that that probably gets us most of the way there. I'm sure I'm forgetting all sorts of things. But uh, like I said, I'll try and keep these coming every week. And maybe as time goes on, um, if I'm finding that it's uh, that I still have stuff to talk about, maybe even more, um, because I it's useful for me to uh, to get these things out of my head. Um. What I'd love is if you guys want to just leave me a comment about what more I can share, what discussion would be useful. Uh, excuse me. Um, you know, tell me how it's, if this is helpful to you and, and what else I can do to to help provide information that maybe you're not finding somewhere else or maybe you want to hear my take on. Um, I do think that for the most part, Zero Carb has been presented with one voice out there. And I think we're starting to get enough people with enough different circumstances now that we know that there isn't necessarily one right way to do it. I think my levels of fat are a great example. You know, I can't eat anywhere near the recommended amount of fats. If I eat ribeye a few days in a row, I will be vomiting and I will have white grease coming out of my rear and uh, and I feel awful. <laughs> and I feel greasy. I don't know. I don't think most people do, but I just I think I don't process it well. So um, that's one of the, my biggest goals about sharing is to just say, hey, you're not doing it wrong as long as you're doing it so that it works for you and you're paying attention and you're trying. Um, and it doesn't work for everyone. We hear from some folks who just don't make it, you know. And on that note, you know, I talked about adaptation. Let's talk about after adaptation really quickly. You know, the concept is that, as I keep talking about, is an elimination diet. It's the ultimate. Now, it's I'm I'm trying to trick you guys a little bit <laughs> because I think that um, 
in my experience, once you get past 30 days, you're going to feel like I did and, and your addiction is broken and you're feeling really well for the most part, probably. And so most folks get to 30 days and they go, screw that. I'm not adding any of that stuff back in, that stuff I thought I wanted. That was my experience. You know, I was sure I was going to be adding back in my, um, oh, I miss my nut butters. I did miss my nut butters. And uh, and fruit, I thought I would add, you know, eat a berry, eat some berries. There's no harm in berries, right? You know, which I probably isn't for most folks. Um, and I have fruit trees everywhere all over this property. And we'll, we'll do a property and lifestyle video at some point. Um, but, you know, I thought I'd add those back in for sure. And come to find out, I really didn't want to. So I am trying to fool you a little bit, but from the elimination diet standpoint, I, I really believe it's it's the ultimate because you'll have a blank slate. So um, do, you know, if you're curious, if you miss stuff, add it back in. I mean, I read about some folks uh, who I follow on Twitter and other people who, you know, they'll go from one experiment, they'll do zero carbon, they'll just go right to a whole different thing for themselves. And I mean, frankly, I think it would kill me, <laughs> but they seem to have generally no problem with it, although a lot of them do identify, you know, okay, I don't think I'll do that again or, or whatever. But yeah, so I encourage you to consider, you know, just taking breaks from stuff and then adding it back in if you think you're going to miss it for the rest of your life. Um, over the holidays, we had a lot of folks on uh, the Reddit, subreddit, Zero Carb, talking about how they cheated and most of them were miserable, but some of them were like, yeah, I ate ice cream and apple pie and I was great, but I'm going back to Zero Carb because I like it better. Um, so you know, we're all over the place. So there isn't one right answer, but uh, you won't know unless you go. You got to get down here to try. Five grams of carbs from plants is not the same as zero carb. And I don't know exactly why that is. I can speculate fiber, um, sugar, plant compounds, anti-nutrients, whatever it might be, you have a specific sensitivity. It, you know, you just don't know until you're here. So I think I'll stop here for this one. And... Um, I think we'll come back and, and uh, I'm not sure which one I'll do next. I've got a few different ideas, but give me some comments if you would and let me know what you'd like to learn about from me, what my experience has been, um, if I can help you at all. And, uh, and, and more than anything, everybody, I just, I got to tell you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Who I almost am about to cry right now. I, this has been so healing for me to finally get this out and to finally share what I've gone through and to get your support. I am crying. I'll share it with you. It's okay. I'm pretty sensitive. You guys probably know that by now. Um, it's just fantastic. So thanks everybody for everything and for uh, just being there. And thanks for listening and watching. So, uh, okay, that's it for now. I'm going to go dry my eyes and uh, I'm not sad. I'm stoked. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, and Big, big, big thank you to all of my uh, Reddit and Twitter friends with all your support. You guys saved my life, I think. So, okay. See you next time. <laughs>